winner of the regular season series between arch rivals Toronto and Hamilton gets the Harold Baller Trophy. Round one, the season opener for both clubs, goes to the Argonauts by a single point. Round two, the Argos clinch the trophy. It's close again. This time they win by two. But the Tiger Cats come back to win round three, this time at home in convincing fashion and just before the playoffs. But do their regular season meetings mean anything now? The answer from both coaches, Bob Belovich and Al Bruno, is no. Those games are played at different times, often with different personnel under very different circumstances. So the Ballard Trophy is history now. It's the Grey Cup. These clubs are eyeing, and the road to Vancouver begins this afternoon for either the Toronto Argonauts, the first-place finishers in the CFL East, or the two-time defending Eastern champion Hamilton Tiger Cats. Live from Iverwind Stadium in Hamilton. Game one of the two-game Eastern Final on CTV. The Tabbies closed out the regular season last Friday, home to Ottawa, and they had their hands full. But they eked out a one-point victory as Paulus Ballston comes through in the dying seconds with this field goal. The Tiger Cats win for the third consecutive time. The Argonauts come to today's game on a win streak of their own. They took back-to-back -back games from Montreal. Last Sunday at the Big O, J.C. Watts gets the Argonauts offense on track as he finds Daryl Smith for a 34-yard gain. That sets up a William Miller touchdown. And in the third quarter, the Argos pour it on. Paul Pearson works himself all alone. Watts finds him. It's a 25-yard major, a 37-16 tune-up for the playoffs. And the win was handy for the Argonauts in that it pushed them back into first place in the East. A slim one point ahead of Hamilton, so they will have home field advantage for the second half of this two-game series. And so today, the Eastern playoffs start in Hamilton. Game one of a total point series between the Argonauts and the Tiger Cats. Just about perfect weather conditions today. A little cloudy, it is cool, and just a light breeze, though we may get a flurry this afternoon. Hello again, everybody. Welcome back to the CFL on CTV. You can tell it's the playoffs here at Ivor Wynn. There's that extra excitement in the crowd. The players are pumped up. And with these two teams being longtime rivals and reasonably well matched, we expect a whale of a ball game today. I think very physical, lots of hard hitting. For their comments, let's go up to the broadcast booth. Pat Marsden standing by with Leif Pedersen. Thank you, Dan. Hello again, everybody. You talk about the excitement. It's here because the Argos definitely have a chance to win this game. Hamilton is favored to win this game. And, Leaf, I think you flip a coin. Well, I think you really do, Pat. You know, it comes down to the issue at this time of the year. Who can protect their quarterback better? The Argonauts have had an awful time this year with the sacks. If Hamilton gets after J.C. Watts early, it could be a long day. If they give him protection, you never know. Well, as a matter of fact, Argos give up more than five sacks a game, and they're playing one of the toughest defenses, so if the Argos haven't corrected that, it could be game over. Anyway, right now, we want to meet these players. Dan Matheson is standing by. Thank you, gentlemen. That's it for us to talk about today's game. Now let's meet the combatants for the first game of the Eastern Final. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Ivor Wynn Stadium. This is the Hamilton Tiger Cats meet the Toronto Argonauts in game one of the Eastern Final. The starting offensive lineup for the Toronto Argonauts. At center, wearing number 51, Mark Napolitan. At left guard, wearing number 69, Dan Barone. Right guard, wearing number 68, Dave Kersinger. At left tackle, running number 64, Chris Schultz. At right tackle, running number 66, Kelvin Brunster. Wing back, running number 25, Paul Pearson. At 
wing back, wearing number 74, Daryl Smith. At running back, wearing number 20, Cedric Minter. At fullback, wearing number 37, Warren Hudson. Receiver wearing number nine, Keith Baker. At wide receiver wearing number 85, Chris Woods. And the quarterback wearing number six, J.C. Watts. saw a classic example of how these two teams are very different. The Argonauts are organized and meticulous. They pay attention to detail. The Tiger Cats come out en masse and will attack in a back. The opening kickoff in just a moment, the CFL playoffs on CTV. Stadium at Hamilton this afternoon. Their Tie Cats had a terrific second half. There is a look at Bobby Bryan, who will be the referee this afternoon, and the rest of the people who will work with him. The Toronto Argonauts, who lost only one game to Eastern opposition this year, they were eight and one, 
the only loss coming here at Ivor Wynn Stadium three weeks ago. So it's going to be very interesting to see just what transpires here in the first half of this home and home series. Dwight Edwards, number 30. Chris Woods, number 85, are back deep to return the kickoff by this man, Paul Osbaldiston, who came on to play for the Ticats when Bernie Ruoff was injured. This will be Edwards from his 25. Edwards struggles to the 40-yard line, brought down there by Ralph Schultz, number 67. So the Toronto Argonauts are going to begin this first series of offensive plays from good field position. J.C. Watts must have the big game, but Cedric Miller is the surprise starter because Willie Miller came down with the flu this past week. Pat, I think really having Keith Baker back in the lineup, of course he played against Montreal last week, I think that's got to help this receiving core. He's a super receiver, runs great routes, and I think he can help out J.C. Watts. J.C. is going to put it up. Or at least he wanted to put it up, but Mitchell Price finally chased him down out of bounds for a loss of a couple of yards. Now, the Argos know that their real Achilles heel is the fact they have not been able to protect the quarterback. And because the secondary did a good job there, there was nobody open for J.C. to throw to. Well, Pat, you make an excellent point. That, of course, really has been their problem. But this group right here, these starting five offensive linemen, that's the best offensive line they've had all season long. If these guys can't get the job done against this front four, then they have no chance. It's second down, about 12 yards to go. J.C. Watts going deep, looking for Smith, and it's over his head. So the Ticats did exactly what they wanted to do. Mark Streeter covered Daryl Smith all the way down the field, but the Cats did exactly what they wanted to do. Shut down the Argos early. There's an intimidating factor there, of course, and then hopefully move the ball themselves when they get it back. Well, the luxury that the Ticats really have is not only do they have an excellent front four and good linebackers, and when they blitz, they've got an excellent group in the secondary. You saw good coverage, one-on-one -on -one Mark Streeter, and that's a real luxury they have. This is Paul Bennett taking Hank Olesic's punt and getting it out to about the 38-yard line. So now let's take a look at that Hamilton Ticat offensive alignment, and they have a fellow at quarterback that I think is going to be a star in this league for many years to come in Mike Kerrigan, who spent three years with the New England Patriots and has really come on in these last few games. Of course, a couple of receivers, Tony Champion and Rocky DiPietro, both over 1,000 yards in receiving this year, so they've got a pretty good group there. Kerrigan looks. He's got Wayne Lee. Lee has the ball at the Toronto 38-yard line, brought down by Daryl Moyer. When you look at Mike Kerrigan, you're looking at the classic drop-back passer. He completes for 34 yards to Wayne Lee on his first pass of the ball game. Well, you know, he's six foot four and he can stand tall in that pocket. He's got great sight lines to all his receivers and what a great way to start the ball game off. Wayne Lee was getting a chance to play this year. Had 46 catches and makes a big one to get them started. The 34-yard game gives Hamilton first down at the Toronto 38-yard line. This is their new running back, Ken Zachary. Zachary does a good job to get inside the 35 to about the 32-yard line as the big fella from Oklahoma State picks up six yards. Gerald Bayless, 99, and David Marshall, 73, the middle linebacker, combined on the tackle. Now, I can remember over the last five years, this was one area that was really a concern area for the Ticats. But this year, they've only allowed 58 sacks. That's third in the league. Miles Correll, of course, he's the offensive line nominee for the Shenleys in the East, so they've, been, they've done a good job. On second and four, Kerrigan throws complete to Rocky DiPietro. And the Rock has a first down at the 25, where Daryl Wilson fills the feet up from under him. Well, excellent play selection by Mike Kerrigan. When you've got a six foot three inside receiver like Rocky DiPietro, and you only need three, four yards to pick up the first down, run that flat pass. He'll make the catch. He can fall for a first down. Smart play. Rocky, a Shenley Award finalist in the Canadian category against Joe Poplowski, didn't play all year and still caught 86 passes for the Ticats. First down, Hamilton, the ball at the Toronto 26. Carrigan unloads and right into the hands of Willie Pless. Willie Pless 
makes the big play for the Argos, as he has done in every game in which he's played. That's why he's the Eastern nominee for the Shenley Rookie of the Year Award. Well, he's just had a super rookie year. Had three interceptions on the season, and this is definitely a ball Mike Kerrigan should have not have thrown. He was getting pressure, shouldn't have thrown it, plus makes the big play. It's a 36-yard interception, and we'll see what the Argos can do when we come back. It is scoreless, and we will return in a moment. At least temporarily, Willie Pless, who stepped in front of that pass that Mike Kerrigan probably wishes now he hadn't thrown, and Toronto has possession of the ball at their 48-yard line with a first down. Highcats had 77 sacks in 1986, but this time it is Cedric Minter. And Minter will get about eight yards, forced out by Howard Fields. This is what the Argos must do this afternoon. Run the football, and they hope with the newcomer Mark Napolitan at center that they'll better be able to do that. Well, I think that's an excellent point, Pat, because in the three games that these teams have played this year, and that's how you have to look at this series now, how they did against each other during the season, the Argos only had about 50 yards a game rushing, and you just can't do that. It's too easy for the defense. They give to Minter again, but there is no way that he could get by Frank Robinson, who appears to have stopped him short of the first down. Well, there's no question they'll call for a measurement here. Very close, but, you know, when you're only rushing the ball 50 yards a game, those defensive linemen, they just tee off and come. You know, there's no fear of trap blocks or anything like that, and I couldn't agree with you more. If they can establish some kind of running game just to slow them down. They are inches short, and to me, Argos must go for it here. I mean, you've got to establish, A, that you're not intimidated by the defense, and B, that in fact you have confidence in somebody like a Cedric Minter, or if you decide to go to the fullback Warren Hudson, or in fact J.C. Watts just keeps it himself. Well, the new center, Mark Napolitan, you talked about. He's six foot three, 260 pounds, with the defense giving a yard off the line of ball. If I'm J.C. Watts, I just tuck right in behind his fanny and pick it up. And Watts does that, and he should have the first down. He just took one step to the right, picks up the first down, as signaled by referee Bob Bryan of Ottawa, and the Argos get their first first down of the ball game. You might mention the one major change that the Thai Cats had to make for this game was Les Brown's knee injury did not heal properly. Jim Rockford is playing the corner. He's number 26 today, and don't be surprised if Argonauts test him. Well, he's out there right now with Keith Baker. This would be as good a time as any to throw it to him. Let's see what he can do. Instead, they go over the middle, and it's knocked away. Leo Esrins and Howard Fields both came across. Well, that's the great thing about that tie cat linebacking core. Leo Esrins, Ben Zambiazzi, and Frank Robinson, they've all got great mobility and range. And that time, Leo Esrins came a long way, but at six foot four, you know, he's got the long arms. He can get up and knock those balls down. So it'll bring up a second and 10 for the Argos. They are in Hamilton territory at the tie cat 52 yard line. Watts will be short of the first down. Rod Skillman is there to make the stop for Hamilton, number 59. Watts, look, look, and let's give the Argo offensive line credit. They did a good job. It was simply that the secondary had everybody covered. Well, last time on second and long, the Ticats blitzed. This time, they just rushed four people, dropped everybody off the line of scrimmage, and they got some pretty good coverage downfield. There's Chris Woods. It's tough if you can't even get off the line of scrimmage, and Jim Rockford, the newcomer, did a good job. That's legal. You can give him one shot. Here's the best punter in the CFL in 1986, averaging 48 and a half yards a punt. Hank Olesic angles it toward the hash mark taken there by Wayne Lee. And Dan Rasevich, as he so frequently is, was first downfield. A 41-yard punt, a five-yard return. It's still scoreless. We'll be back in a moment. Conditions near perfect here today. Just a little bit of a breeze. The turf is dry at the moment. The snow so far has held off. And I think we've answered one question already. The coaches were a little concerned about maybe the intensity level today since it's a two-game series. But the hitting we've seen so far, Patrick, I think they're up for this one. Boy, Dan, I couldn't agree with you more. They are rocking and socking out there as the Ticats start in a hole at their 10-yard line. First down. 
give us to Zachary. And there isn't much there. Zachary gets a couple of yards, maybe. David Marshall, the middle linebacker, stuck his nose in there. He's had a tremendous season for the Argos as Ken Zachary gets to about the 12 and a half yard line. Uh, Mark Seal, also number 76, just stood Dale Sanderson, the right guard, right up, and he plugged up the hole and allowed Marshall to make the tackle. That's what you like, though. Your defensive linemen stuff it up and let the linebackers make all the hits. And this is what the Argos like now. Kerrigan has to put it up. Second down. About seven yards to go. Kerrigan looking. Fires to the back, out of the backfield. Zachary, and he fights his way over the 20 to the 21-yard line, and he may well have that first down because of that last little second effort. Well, Willie Pless came up and made the play. He dropped off from his coverage and came up to make the hit, but when you've got a 229-pound back like Ken Zachary, sometimes you can't stop him dead in his tracks, and those extra couple of steps picked up the first down. That's great effort. It is terrific effort for Ken Zachary and the Hamilton Tie Cats, who now have it at their 21. First down. The pass is complete to the 48 yard line. Steve Stapler gathers in. Mike Kerrigan's pass has the big first down of 27 yards. Well, the Toronto Argonauts were in a zone coverage, and once Kerrigan breaks the pocket, now the fun starts. Everybody starts running around, and Stapler found a little open seam, got in behind Daryl Boyer, and that's a big gain. You know, back-to-back -back first downs, you start on your own 10-yard line. You want to get it out of your own territory. They've done a great job. They have it now at about their own 49-yard line. First down, Hamilton. This is Zachary again. This time, though, he's nailed for a loss of about a yard. Well, that's the thing now, though, Pat. You've got some breathing room. Get those back-to-back -back first downs. Now, you know, if your drive stalls, it's it's not a big deal. You can punt it away, and you've, you've got back that field position. In a playoff game, anytime field position dictates so much of what you can do offensively. So it'll be second down and just a little more than 10 yards to go for the first down. Kerrigan over the middle to Wayne Lee. And Lee will be close. The stop is made by Cliff Hewitt, the inside safety number 15. Now this could be decision time for Al Bruno. But with less than a yard, you can almost count that he's going to go for it. Well, they're going to test number 15, Cliff Hewitt. A blitzing situation, one-on-one -on -one with the slot back going across the field. It's tough to stay with him. He did a good job, and I think he made a good tackle to keep him short. as Lee pointed out they are short by about a foot and a half the ball is in Toronto territory as you take a look at Bob Obilovich head coach for five years of the Argos four first place finishes he took over a club that was in the basement brought them to the top and then for the second time in his five-year career he has moved the Argos from the bottom to the top because of course last year they finished dead last so it is third and inches Kerrigan keeps it himself. He has the first down as he reaches the Toronto 50-yard line. Nice to have a quarterback who's 6'4", 215 pounds, when you only need a few inches to pick up a first down. Well, I went down and watched him in his pregame warm-up. He is absolutely the classic drop-back passer. He sets up so perfectly. And I ran into Ronnie Lancaster, who should know a little bit about that. He said, yeah, he is unquestionably textbook style. Yeah, he is. And you know what I like? Everybody was out in the warm-up, all bundled up with the cold. He was out in the T-shirt. <laughs> Those are the kind of guys you like oh, to play for. absolutely. Kerrigan again to his release man, Wayne Lee. And Lee, showing real good effort, gets to the 41-yard line where Marlon Jones, the defensive end, was there to bring him down. You know, I talked about Wayne Lee earlier and his contribution to the Ticats this year. You know, he's played for four years. In his first three years, he only caught a total of 32 balls. This year, in 1986, he's got 46, so he surpassed what he's done in three years. He's caught three balls early, already in this first quarter, and, boy, he opened up the game with a nice long pass. And he comes up just short of the first down, so it'll be second 
And about a foot and a half to go for the first down for Hamilton. You know, he's originally a defensive back in university, and I, I have to believe that that helps you read the zones a little bit. I think that's an excellent point, Leaf. Kerrigan has been good on six of seven passes for 96 yards, and what a string he's put together here. Keeps it himself and has another Hamilton first down as he crosses the 40 into about the 39-yard line of the Argonauts. But you make a valid point, too, as we take a look at Al Bruno trying for his third Eastern Conference championship in succession. When you have a guy the size of Mike Kerrigan, there are a lot of things you can do on third, on second down and short yardage. You can throw the ball, but you know you've got the first down within. Well, Mike Kerrigan, he spent three years with the New England Patriots. Of course, did not see a lot of playing time, but I'm sure under Steve Grogan down there, who was the starting quarterback, he had to learn quite a bit about offense. His pass is complete to Tony Champion. And Champion has the first down. A flag will come down. You'll have a face mask call against Kerry Parker. It was a little deep by Champion to get by Parker. And as he did so, Parker reached up, grabbed him by the face mask. And this will be much more than a first down. Well, once again, he's working on Kerry Parker. Kerry Parker said in the paper this week, in the last game against Hamilton, I was burned twice by Tony Champion. I was too aggressive. I tried to overplay him. Well, this time he said, I'm going to lay off a little more. He laid off him there, and that was an easy out and catch. And with the penalty tacked on, the ball now comes to the 13-yard line of the Argos. It is first down, Hamilton. Don't forget, this drive started on Hamilton's 10-yard line. It has been an impressive one. Carrying into the end zone, touchdown, Tony Champion. Beautiful drive, great play selection, terrific execution, and it culminates in a picture-perfect pass from quarterback Mike Kerrigan to that man, Tony Champion, the speedster, formerly with the Dallas Cowboys. Well, in the three meetings this year between the Ticats and Argos, he was their leading receiver, so why not go to him in a crit critical situation? Osbaldiston is good, as he has been on every attempt this year. And the Ticats have gone out in front 7-0. Let's look at it one more time, Leaf. Well, Pat, they were trying to protect the cornerback, Kerry Parker. He rolled up in a, what we call a cloud zone coverage to try and bump Tony Champion. He got inside, broke to the corner. There was no help from the inside safety, Darrell Wilson, and that's an easy touchdown. The Ticats lead the Argos 7-0. We'll be back with the Hamilton kickoff in just a moment. Tony Champion in his pregame warm-up. He looks like a racehorse. He has those great legs. Speed to burn as Osbaldiston gets the kickoff away to Dwight Edwards at his 24. Well, Edwards did a good job to get out over the 40-yard line because it looked like he was going to be wrapped up back about the 30. But this is the dimension that he has added to Toronto since coming two weeks ago to the club. We'll talk about Tony Champion. He's 6'1", 175 pounds, a slender guy, but as you said, a real speedster. And, you know, you hate the playoff game to have a breakdown in coverage, but that's exactly what happened. And the last time these two teams met, a breakdown in coverage cost them a touchdown with Tony Champion. So the Argos begin from their 42-yard line. Chris Woods. And Woods gets out over the 50 to about the 51-yard line. Frank Robinson along with Paul Bennett there to bring him down. That's a favorite play in the Argonaut scheme of things, that quick screen to the wide receiver, Chris Woods. You talk about blinding speed, this fellow sure has it. Over 1,000 yards in receptions. I'm, not, I'm surprised they haven't gone against Jim Rockford early to test him out, though. That's a point well made. On second down, a yard to go. This is Cedric Mitter, and Mitter has the first down for Toronto into Hamilton territory at the 53, where he runs into 31, Ben Zambiazzi, and 43, Frank Robinson. Of course, Cedric Minner missing the last three games with a hamstring injury. William Miller was scheduled to play in this game, but he came down with the flu this week, could not practice. So, of course, Cedric Minner, lucky to have him in the lineup. 
J.C. Watts has completed one of three passes prior to this one to Keith Baker. And that was exactly the same play to the other side of the field, the Baker that they tried with Chris Woods. Grover Covington brings him down at the 45-yard line. It'll be a pickup of eight. Well, if the Tiger Cat cornerbacks are going to lay off like that, I think they should just keep running that play. The key is to get the first block on the corner. Paul Pearson, twice in a row, has made excellent blocks. J.C. Watts is the starter, but no guarantee that he'll be the finisher. Holloway is available if needed. This is Warren Hudson, and the big fullback was looking for the first down. He appears to be just a little bit short, but it'll be a situation where the Argos can go for it on third down if, in fact, he is short. Mike Walker, 61, who had such an outstanding season in sacking quarterbacks. He had 21 of them. And Grover Covington, 77, were there to make the stop. short by about an inch so this is a snap or it should be anyway for J.C. Well the nice thing that they've been able to do on this drive on their first first down and now of course in the second opportunity they've got good yardage on first down with those two quick screens to the wide receivers they picked up eight yards a pop you know and boy, it, it simplifies the game for you so much when you can do that. Third and inches. J.C. keeps it himself. He makes it, but he's lucky that it wasn't a yard and inches to go because they, they did stop him, but he did pick up the necessary inches. You know where he went behind, too? Big <laughs> number 64, Chris Schultz, 6'9", 275, and I think that's a pretty good choice. Yeah, I'd be inclined to go behind somebody 6'9", <laughs> as sure. well. You know, I, it's beyond me, but there has been criticism of Bob Obilovich, even some people suggesting that he should be replaced. Now, the guy has finished first four out of five years. The Argos hadn't been in a Grey Cup for 30-some years. He took them there his very first year, and the second year he won the Grey Cup, and now they're calling for a scalp. If that makes sense, I wish somebody would explain it to me. First down, Toronto. The ball is up to Hamilton, 43. pass off the hands of Keith Baker but I'll tell you he had a lot of time and there was a good job done on Grover Covington Chris Schultz is doing an excellent job on Covington but here's Keith, Keith Baker they're protecting Jim Rockford they rolled him up and now Mark Streeter picks him up deep he does a good job to stay with him but I think Keith Baker should have made this catch you know he does have good hands but you know when you jump in the air maybe you think you're going to get your legs cut out from underneath you and sometimes that makes you a little edgy but he should have made that catch. It's second and ten Argos. Safety blitz. And the pass is off the hands of Daryl Smith. You know what, Pat? These Argonaut receivers are being intimidated. You know, he could have made that catch. Baker could have made the last catch. You know, they're looking around, waiting to get hit. It's a simple fact of intimidation. You see Howard Fields there. I know he's talking to I played with him. He's saying, you're not going to catch a ball on me all day. These guys are intimidated. Watch this. A good throw by J.C. Watts. The safety blitz coming, and I think he kind of went up half-hearted for that one. So it brings Hank Kalisic in for his third punt of the ball game. And he angles it towards Paul Bennett. And Bennett makes the catch and steps out of bounds of the four. What a great putt by Hank Olisic because now the Ticats are hemmed in once again. A 39-yard boot with no return. You know, I talked to Art Aselta, who's the Argonaut offensive coordinator before the game, and one of the things that they were really disappointed in the last time they were here at Iverwin was Hank Olisic's kicking because although he kicked for a great average and got some single points, they wanted him to kick out of bounds and pin Hamilton in deep. He's been able to do that twice already today. However, the last time the Argo defense couldn't do anything to stop the Hamilton Ticats who marched 100 yards in 10 plays for the only touchdown of the ball game. This is Zachary who was very nearly nailed for a safety touch by Gerald Bayless. He slipped out of Bayless's grasp and got to the one yard line. But boy oh boy there was great penetration by Bayless as the first quarter rapidly comes to an end. It is Hamilton 7. 
Toronto nothing. We'll return with the second quarter in a moment. What a terrific first quarter. The Hamilton Ticats lead the Argos 7 to nothing, but the Ticats in a real jackpot now. Second and 12 back at their two yard line. Kerrigan fires and out of bounds. Steve Stapler couldn't catch up to the ball, but even had he, it would have been out of bounds. Let's take a look at what happened statistically in that first quarter. Well, that's and show. much of the yardage yeah. will show that the Ticats had that one great march of 100 yards, 135 to 40. The only turnover was that pass interception by Willie Pless. You know, this is the one thing I don't like about having your wide receiver be your punter. Now, Steve Stapler just ran about a 40-yard pass pattern. He's got to come back. He's got to be a little tired after that. Now he's got to kick you out of trouble. I don't know. Yeah, and he's a slow punter, too. I imagine they're going to come right after this one. Well, he got good protection. He sends this one high. Not that deep, though. Graysley at the 34-yard line. And he doesn't get much, but he hangs on to the football at the 33. Ed Gattavakis is down quickly to make the stop. 33 yards the punt, two yards the return, but the Argos, because of their defensive unit, are in good shape. The Western Final, the BC Lions against either the Edmonton Eskimos or the Calgary Stampeders, we'll know later this afternoon, comes to you here on CTV next Sunday afternoon at 4.30. The winner of that ball game will go to the Grey Cup representing the Western Conference. J.C. Watts with that hit screen again to Chris Woods. Look at the gate on this man. He crosses the 20 into the 19. It's a Toronto first down. Lance Shields along with Paul Bennett were there to make, make the stop for Hamilton, but it's a 15-yard pickup for Chris Woods. Well, they're getting the key initial block that time. Once again, 25 Paul Pearson. You know, he's a great receiver, but he's doing a great job blocking. He gets enough of a piece of Howard Fields. There you see it. And that allows the speed of Chris Woods just to keep going upfield. Good blocking. Watts pass was very nearly picked off by the newcomer, Jim Rockford, but the ball went right through his hands. Now, I mean, I don't care if Rockford's as slow as I am. He's going to go the other way for a touchdown because nobody but nobody was in front of him. He's fortunate that he did get his hand on the ball, though, because Baker was in behind him. Well, there's definitely miscommunication here between quarterback and receiver. The Argonauts are very fortunate. Ball is at the Hamilton 19, where it is second down, 10 yards to go, Toronto. Watts for Daryl Smith, nowhere near him. Well, in the three meetings between these clubs, the Hamilton quarterbacks passed for just over 60%, and the Toronto Argonauts passed for under 50%, and that is holding true here this afternoon. As Lance Chomick, who set an Argonaut field goal record in this 1986 season, he kicked 37 of them, and that beats Zen and Andrew Sisson's record of 32, is on to try a 26-yarder. 37 of 48 on the year. And that one is good. I mean, it went, it went like a rifle shot. No height at all, and it just cleared the crossbar. As the Argos hit the scoreboard, but the Ticats continue to lead it. Hamilton 7, Toronto 3. We'll be back in a moment. From Tire Cats leading this game 7-3, interesting talking to the players. They say from both teams, neither club is doing anything at all different today. No new formations, no trick plays, but players from both teams are expecting wrinkles at any moment. They think somebody's going to come up with a surprise soon. I'll tell you, Dan, what the Argos are doing differently is they're protecting their quarterback. Unfortunately, he hasn't been able to throw the ball very well, and I would think if he doesn't pick it up shortly, Codridge Holloway is going to see some action. Hamilton starts at their 35-yard line. Kerrigan unloads to Jed Tommy, and Tommy is wrapped up by well, Don Moan, number 36. Well, just when it looked like Kerrigan was going to be sacked, he got it away to Tommy, who only picks up a couple of yards, but it's better than losing. It's interesting how this game has progressed so far. The Argonaut offensive line's done an excellent job protecting J.C. Watson. The Toronto Argonaut front four, who normally are not a good sacking group, have put some pretty good pressure at times on Mike Kerrigan.
Kerrigan fires across the middle to Rocky Di Pietro. Willie Pless wraps him up. There is a penalty marker down in the Toronto secondary. Usually indicates some form of interference. I couldn't really see what was being called or who there collided is. with who. Well, let's see. Here it is. Holding Toronto number 15. Number 15, Cliff Hewitt is called for holding, so he obviously grabbed a receiver. He was going to just slip by him. Well, it's interesting. Cliff Hewitt was quoted in the Toronto papers this week as talking about Rocky DiPietro. He said he's a physical receiver. Well, you sure don't hear that too often. Defensive back talking about a receiver and saying he's physical. You know, you always say, well, the guy's faster. He's got great hands, but... Rocky Di Pietro certainly is a physical kind of guy. 6'3, about 215, and he likes to go down and push off people. So the penalty gives Hamilton a first down just inside their 47 yard line. There's the screen to Tony Champion. And Champion's very close to another first down. He was able to evade the tackle by Hewitt. And then Carl Braisley finally did make the stop. But it's a first down because of the speed of that man, Tony Champion. Tony Champion, look at those black things on his arms and the gloves he's wearing. Those are the new skin diver kind of gloves that the receivers are wearing. It's a soft kind of rubber that really gives good traction on the football, and he laces a piece of it all the way up his arms, so when he's carrying the ball, there's less chance of fumbling it. So it is first down, Hamilton at the Toronto 53-yard line. Again, they throw the screen to Champion. And they are going to rule, I believe, that he was down at midfield. His knee touched down. Rocky Di Pietro was out there trying to throw the block, but he only got a piece of the tackler. Cliff Hewitt. Well, there you go. Good look at it. If he's down, all you got to do is touch that shoulder pad, which I believe he did, so that's an excellent call. The timing on those quick screens is so critical. You know, you've got so precise to get that blocker up, get that one little block. So the loss is actually about three yards, and the ball is just on the Hamilton side of midfield. This game is just roaring along. I mean, we've only got 10 minutes and 50 seconds left to play in this first half. Kerrigan just dumps it off to Jet Thomas. And that's obviously the game plan, because Kerrigan has looked to that back coming out of the backfield a number of times. Jet Tommy, whose roots go back to Ottawa, but who is from Guelph University, that's where he played his college ball, didn't play at all last year when he ripped up his knee, but he's a factor now as the fullback in that Hamilton scheme. It's third down and about a yard and change to go. And Ken Hobart comes in at quarterback. Now, for those of you who may not follow the CFL, Hobart is a great runner. Kerrigan is the pure passer. Hobart the runner, and they're gambling on third and a yard and a half to go. But they get to Dan Hucklock instead. Hucklock gets the first down as he gets to the Toronto 41 or 42 yard line. Now well, that's a big first down to pick up. You want to keep this drive going. Toronto's come back with a field goal now. You want to answer it if you can. It's apparent what they're planning to do. As we see that short yardage play up over the top for Dan Hucklack. It's apparent when Toronto blitzes, they try. Kerrigan's going to go deeper downfield. When they drop off in the zone, he's just going to dump it to one of the backs. First down, Ty Cats. This one is picked up. David Marshall, the middle linebacker. And he's dragged down by Ken Zachary, but for the second time in this ball game, the Toronto Argonaut defense comes up big for them. First, Willie Pless. Now, David Marshall and the Ticats again are stalled. Well, this is simply a case of tunnel vision because he's looking dark. Di Pietro all the way. Does not see middle linebacker David Marshall. Had three interceptions on the year, and what a big one here. And what a good first half of play. It's 7-3. Hamilton leads Toronto with 9.21 left in the second quarter. We'll be back in a moment. There's a look at David Marshall, who was selected the Argos' top defensive player of 1986. And this is Cedric Mitter. Ooh, boy, was he zapped by Paul Beck. 
as he got to about the Hamilton 42. He'll have a pickup of five yards. But he couldn't have helped his knees any. I really think this is a smart idea by the Argonauts. And of course, they saw the Hamilton's last game of the season with Ottawa. Ottawa was able to run the football against this front four. And I think if Toronto's going to win, they have to do some of this as well. Four carries, 21 yards for Cedric Minner so far. But forget it this time. Boy, oh boy, when the tie cats start blowing in on you, like Rod Skillman did against J.C. Watts, it just turns a football game right around. And there's nothing more deflating than to have a little success on offense, and all of a sudden, a big sack like that takes you out of scoring range, and boy, the air comes out of the balloon in a hurry. Skillman just came in untouched. There you see two guys going after Mitchell Price. Skillman comes free, and the only guy to pick him up is J.C. Watts. <laughs> so Alisic is punting. And this rocket will be handled by Wayne Lee at his five. And he slips down as he gets over the 10 to about the 12. But again, the story of this football game has been the poor field position that Hamilton has been forced to endure most of this half. Well, it's coming up fast, isn't it? Two weekends from today. We'll all be in Vancouver. Leaf and I will show you the Great Cup game of 1985 on Saturday. And then live, the Great Cup parade will come to you on CTV. On Sunday, the pregame show and the game itself. All the action, all the fun, and all the excitement here on CTV. Great Cup weekend, two weekends from today. Well, could be the Hamilton Tiger Cats. We'll show you them in the last year's replay on Saturday. This is Zachary. Zachary running hard is out over the 15 to about the 18. He'll have a pickup of about six yards. But you know, when you look at this Toronto Argonaut squad, this is really the best team they have put on the field in 1986. Their offensive line is by far the best that they've been able to field. And then with Willie Pless back and healthy, Cedric Mitter into the lineup offensively. I mean, they, they have not had personnel this good in all of this season. And there is Pless. Boy, he is a great-looking candidate for longevity in this league. Well, he didn't play for the Mississauga Juniors, I'll tell you that. He played at the University of Kansas and was one of the great linebackers in that school's history. That's Dwight Edwards, of course, who played for the Mississauga Juniors. Ken Zachary is the injured ball player on this play. and We can pick up exactly what happened to him. Uh, really tell you get those pileups well, big miles Gorel sitting on your head that might hurt a little bit I still think that it's not meant to be unkind but the best line that Leo Cahill ever had was what he said they should add an A to Miles' last name Miles didn't like it very much either. <laughs> Gorilla <laughs> because he is massive at 6'8 285 pounds well, let's hope there's nothing wrong with Ken Zachary. There's Big Miles. Well, he's up against Roger Aldag of the Saskatchewan Rough Riders for the Offensive Lineman of the Year. And a great tribute to Miles and the entire offensive line. They've done a good job for Hamilton this year. I remember so many people saying, oh, if they could only get an offensive line, this could be a good football team. Well, now they have it. Well, they don't want to lose Ken Zachary, though. He's limping off the field. He looks like that angle's, ankle's pretty tender. He's the kind of guy you in a playoff series, you've got to have him in there. He's rushed the ball well, he catches the ball well, he averages almost 10 yards of reception. You know, he wasn't here very long, but he gained 275 yards rushing, almost five yards of carry, and a couple of touchdowns. He caught 12 passes. This is for a fellow who's only been in the lineup. This is third game, I believe. And he's like all the new running backs. He's big, strong, and fast. 230 pounds, wow. It's second down, four yards to go, Hamilton. The pass is caught by Di Pietro out over the 30 to the 31-yard line. And it was a good thing that Kerrigan got rid of that ball because Marlon Jones was right in his face. Well, you're going to watch a veteran receiver read a zone coverage. There's the linebacker that goes out. Now he stops, works back to the inside, stays in the open area. And, you know, that's why you go to a Rocky Di Pietro who's been around for nine years in the crunch. You go to him because you know he'll be open. Biggest crowd of the season by far here in Ivor Wynn Stadium this afternoon as the Cats start from their 32-yard line. First down. Kerrigan looked 
And all oh, beautiful looking pattern again to Rocky Di Pietro up in midfield. Daryl Moyer is there to make the stop, but not before 23, gains 23, and Hamilton has moved the ball again. Well, the all time leading tie cat receiver in yardage receptions, he's 10th on the all time CFL list. Makes the catch, but Kerrigan stands in, takes the big hit. You know, he threw that before Rocky even made his last break. That's great timing. Rocky has caught three for 43 yards this afternoon. Hamilton with a first down at midfield. And the give is to the fullback, Jed Tommy, but there's nothing there. Tommy will get maybe a yard as he ran right into the heart of that defensive alignment of the Argos. They play a 4-3. With Marlon Jones, Gerald Bayless, Mark Seal, and Rodney Harding in front, across the front. Seven to three is our score. A touchdown by Tony Champion, a field goal by Lance Chomick. That's the scoring to this point, with five minutes and 40 seconds left to play in this first half. It's been a good one. Kerrigan fires the catch is made by Di Pietro for the first down inside the 40 to the 38 yard line. Willie Pless finally brings him down. 15 yards the pickup by the fellow that Leaf told you is considered a physical receiver. Well, they go to the right guy. You know, Toronto only rushed three people. They drop nine off. You go to the right guy because Rocky can find those open spots in the zone coverage. Watch Carl Brazley bounce off him. It's like a little mosquito just hitting him. First down, Ticats. Ooh! Boy, was Kerrigan fortunate that Parker didn't steal that one and go the distance. Steve Stapler was the intended receiver. Kerry Parker been victimized a couple of times by Tony Champion. This time, Steve Stapler working on him. And if you're going to throw the wide side out, you better have a gun for an arm. That time, Kerrigan was very fortunate. He hung the ball up and. Harry Parker couldn't make the catch, but that could have been deadly. So it's second and ten tie cats. The ball is at the Argo 38. While Di Pietro tried to make a one-handed catch, there was no way the ball was high and behind him. He took the hit from Willie Pless, nevertheless. Well, the key thing, though, they, they weren't able to pick up the first down, but they drove it deep out of their own territory once again, and they're going to end up with a field goal opportunity by Paul Osbaldiston, and that really has been the key in the first half, Hamilton's ability to get themselves out of trouble. I saw Kerrigan walk over to Wayne Lee and have a word with him. It tells me that Lee must have run the wrong pattern. <laughs> As Osbaldiston will try this one from 45, his longest this year was 51 yards, so this is within his range. It is good. Well, what a job that young man has done since coming out to replace the injured Bernie Rua. Paul Osbaldiston has given the Hamilton Ticats a 10 to 3 lead, and we'll be back in just a moment. Ken Zachary is a Tiger Cats major running threat. There is a chance he will not be back in this ballgame. Sprained left ankle. He will not play this quarter. They'll try to get him back in shape at halftime. Well, that would be a real bad blow. You know, I saw him down on the field before the game, and when I first saw him, I thought it was a defensive lineman. I couldn't believe the size of him. The ball blows off the kicking tee, so Osbaldiston has to put it back up there. Ticats have 15 first downs, Toronto only four. Ticats have 219 offensive yards to Toronto's 53. And yet it's only a 10-3 ball game in favor of the Ticats. Well, wow, they've been playing on a long football yeah. field today. Oh, that's right. This is Dwight Edwards from his 16. And Edwards gets out to the 35, 36 yard line, which is where the Argos are going to put it into play. Ed Gatavakis did a great job down there just to slow up Dwight Edwards just when it looked as though he had a steep bit of room to move through. But they spot the ball right at the 35 as J.C. Watts comes out to continue as the Argonaut quarterback. You know, you made a point earlier. You thought maybe they might make a switch. And I think if things continue this way and they give good protection to the quarterback, then you might see Conrad Holloway come in because it's a safer bet with him in there. He doesn't have to move around as much.
This is the dimension, however, that J.C. adds to this game plan. He gets the first down out over the 45 to about the 48-yard line. And chased out by Grover Covington. There's a penalty marker down on the field. And it's in the Hamilton secondary. Well, you know, when you look at these two quarterbacks, Holloway and J.C. Watts, Watts averages 6.5 yards when he runs with the football. Holloway, 2.3. A prime example why J.C. is starting this holding game to get away from Hamilton. that rush. First down. There was a holding penalty against somebody in that Ticat secondary. And consequently, because he made the first down, Toronto declines the penalty. As you take a look at Al Bruno, he feels very good about his club. He is concerned at their lack of consistency on offense. But today, they've certainly come through, although they only do have the 10 points. Cedric Benner, boy, there appeared to be movement along the line of scrimmage, or the ball came out late or something. Nevertheless, no penalty marker down as Benner gets to about the 51, where Grover Covington makes the tackle. A little trouble with the exchange from center Mark Napolitan and J.C. Watts. You know, Al Bruno, I think the most significant thing he said at our press conference with him yesterday was, you have to treat this game like you can't protect the lead. If you get a lead, you've got to keep trying to pour it on. You can't sit back on it. Pick up with three yards at second and seven. This is Keith Baker. Well, he has the option to throw. And he does to Warren Hudson. Well, a little razzle-dazzle in the Toronto offense, which is not known for it. It was the actually a lateral pass to Keith Baker. He throws the forward pass off of it. And though it wasn't designed to go to Warren Hudson, I'm sure they do pick up the first down. Well, he was a quarterback at Texas Southern. And they have this in their scheme for him to throw it. And let me tell you, if he throws it deep, he can throw it a long way. So two minutes and 40 seconds left to play in the first half. The Hamilton Ticats out in front of the Toronto Argonauts 10 to 3. And the Argos hoping that they could put a little bit of a march together there and maybe tie up this ball game. We'll see if they do when we come back in a moment. Seconds left to play in the half. Toronto with a first down at the Hamilton 48-yard line. Watts is going deep looking for Smith. He's got it at the five and in for the touchdown. In speaking with Bob Obilovich yesterday, he told me he thought they could get the Paul Bennett. Well, I haven't seen the films. I suspect they got the Paul Bennett on that one because Daryl Smith was in behind them and scored an easy touchdown. Well, they got the matchup they wanted. Three receivers to one side, and that means Paul Bennett's locked up man-to-man -man with the third guy inside. That was Daryl Smith. He just simply took it straight up field. A good throw, and 48 yards later, he's got his team in a position to tie it up. Exactly the kind of game that many of us felt it would be tight because the clubs have played so tightly against each other. Toronto won two games by a total of three points. Hamilton won the other game by ten. Well, you know, sometimes you put offensive schemes in just to go against certain guys. And you make a good point about Paul Bennett. That's the guy in the secondary you want to attack. And well, I remember as a receiver, when they call a certain play and you know that maybe you're going to be the one that gets to work against Bennett, he got a great chance to score, and Daryl Smith took advantage. And Lance Chomick's point after has tied the ball game and tied the series at 10 points apiece. This is the first game of a two-game total point series. There would not be overtime at the end of this ball game if the clubs are tied. The Carling O'Keefe Game Stars of today's game will receive a Royal Canadian Mint one ounce gold coin. Presented by Remington Products, makers of the 3M surgical clippers for hospitals, and the micro screen rechargeable for you at home. Advanced shaving technology only from Remington. Jamek is ready for the kickoff. So is Tony Champion and Howard Fields. They are back to return it. And this will be Fields from his 24-yard line. And he 
He's dropped as he crosses the 45 to about the 47. He was able to get by Dan Rasovich and it looked for a moment as though Fields was going to take that one a long way. But then hopping on his back was Gerald Bayless. And so the Ticats still nevertheless do start in good field position. Well, there's Gerald Bayless and that's not a great deal of punt playing on the kickoff team but he makes the best of it. Kerrigan has been effective throwing the football but he has had two interceptions and both snuffed out what looked like very promising Hamilton drives. And this time he is snowed under back at the 40 yard line by Mark Seal the former Ottawa Rough Rider who has really played well in the last half of this season comes on to make the sack for the Argos who are not known for their sacking ability. Well, I think he's finally found a home in Toronto. You know, he was originally the 12th round draft choice of the New York Giants back in 1982, protected by Ottawa, bumped around to Saskatchewan a few teams, but has really played well for the Argonauts this year. A big sack right there. Argos ranked last in the league in quarterback sacks. They only had 43. The pass for Stickler is picked up by Daryl Moyer. Moyer is down to the 32-yard line of the Ticats. The third interception of this half. Mike Kerrigan throws the ball well, but obviously he throws it into coverage too often. And on that occasion, Moyer just sat back there, and that was like picking cherries. Well, Mike Kerrigan has to understand that sometimes the defense wins some battles, and you've got to throw the football away or eat it. Every time he's thrown into coverage today and taken a chance, they've picked it off. That's the third one, and sooner or later, all these things catch up with you. 33 yards, the return by Moyer. First down, Toronto at the Hamilton 32. The pass is caught by Keith Baker. And Baker is inside the 25-yard line for a pickup of about eight yards before Frank Robinson slid across to make the stop along with Terry Lane, number 37. Well, once again, the key, though, is they're getting great yardage on their first down plays, and it's simply that quick screen to the wide receivers. I think that's about the fifth time now they've run that. I don't think they've got less than eight yards every time they tried it. There's Daryl Boyer, eight years, originally from the University of Calgary, played with Montreal, Calgary Stampeders, and big play he made right there only had one interception in 1986 but that was a good one he had just that notice that Howard Fields is out of the lineup and Terry Lane number 37 is in to replace him I'm wondering if Fields was shaken up when he returned that kickoff just moments ago well I can see him standing over in the sidelines there and there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with him it's second down two yards to go Argos the ball inside the Hamilton 25 Little play action fake, and then J.C. takes off himself. Touchdown! Julius Caesar Watts has put the Toronto Argonauts out in front, 16 to 10, with a 25-yard scamper. Well, when things are going your way, it's funny how it works, you know. The element of surprise, he wanted to hit the home run ball to Chris Woods, but great coverage dictates that he has to now run with it. Nobody there to stop him. 25 yards, a touchdown. The interceptions finally caught up with the Ticats. Well, it's been an outstanding effort by that defensive squad of the Toronto Argonauts, and it goes to show you what a difference that kid Willie Pless does make. Plus the fact that the Argo quarterback is now getting some time and because it is J.C. Watts, when the people are covered, he can take off. He hasn't thrown the ball particularly well today, but he has done it effectively enough to keep the yardsticks moving on occasion. And right now, the Argos, with a minute and 20 seconds left to play in the first half, have gone in front for the first time in this ball game, 17 to 10. Well, I, I sure like the style of the Argonaut offense on that play. You know, second and short. Why not take a shot at going for the home run? Of course, he couldn't get the pass into Chris Woods, but he ran for the touchdown. I like that kind of offense. It excites everybody on the team. It excites the guys on defense, offense, everything. And boy, when you do that, you've got a lot of success. Well, 
Well, that touchdown really set up by the interception by Daryl Moyer, who tells me that there's been no change in their defensive scheme. He said he got lucky with the overthrow by Kerrigan, but he says the key in the last uh, quarter has been the pressure by the front four. He says that's where the Argonauts are really starting to turn it on defensively. The kickoff will be handled by Fields at his 22. There's that scene we talked about on the last kickoff. Fields is all the way down to the 10 yard line. That's exactly that scene that Dan Rasevich missed the last time. And that same seam opened up, and this time he goes 77 yards. I'll tell you what, this is entertainment at its best. Look at the blocking here. They set it up. What a great sh shot to run through. Howard Field, 77 yards. Well, they, they could answer that touchdown by J.C. Watts right away. That's what you want to do. You've got to try and reestablish yourself. And what a great opportunity for Mike Kerrigan now. They're at the 11-yard line. They've got to punch it in. A saving tackle by Lance Chomick as the Ticats have the ball just outside the Toronto 10. And around to Tony Champion. Read well by Carl Brasley. And then Wilson comes in to help out. There will be a loss of a couple. Well, I think they're going to call Champion for objectionable conduct, too. As he got up off the ground, he took a shot at somebody. Well, Brasley just played it perfectly. Here's the call. Objectionable conduct, penalty number one. Well, that's why we call Lee Pedersen the spy. <laughs> he can detect these things. No, this is an area where you really have to keep your composure. You know, Tony Champion's thinking, gosh, on the reverse, I've got a chance to score here. All of a sudden... Carl Brasley makes a great defensive play. Tony Champion's frustrated. He thought maybe he should get that one in the end zone on that kind of a trick play. And he gets up off the ground. Somebody probably said, no way you're going to get by me. And he took exception to that. Cost him 15 big yards. Yeah, and Al Bruno's not going to be happy at that. I mean, it's bad enough losing a couple of yards. But then when you get the objectionable conduct tacked on, the ball is back to the 22-yard line. First down, Hamilton. Excuse me, second down. Again, the receiver did not look. Wayne Lee got down to the secondary of the Argo defense, and instead of looking for the football, he was trying to deep the defensive back. Kerrigan, who doesn't have all day to throw the football, threw it, and Lee wasn't looking. So instead of a shot at a game-tying touchdown, a couple of real miscues by the Ticats have forced them into a Paul Osbaldiston field goal attempt. It'll come from the 29-yard line. And it's wide. Well, this was a nightmare for the Ticats. With 52 seconds left to play in this first half, the Argos lead it by 6, 17 to 11. Boy, can you feel a momentum shift? You know, sometimes we kind of over overplay momentum, but, boy, oh, boy, it really has changed around here in the second quarter. Things were really going well for the Tiger Cats. They, they moved the ball well. Now, all of a sudden, Big run by J.C. Watts, a couple of interceptions, and now a missed field goal. You really feel it shifting. Ticats are fortunate, Leaf, apropos to your comment, that the half is coming to an end. They'll get a chance to go in there and regroup because if there was about 10 minutes to go in this half, you're liable to see Argos, you know, score a couple of fast touchdowns. Haas goes to Cedric Metter. And Cedric is out over the 45 to the 46 where Jim Rockford, 26, and Frank Robinson, 43, are there to bring him down. Well, we're just 46 minutes away from halftime, and here's what will happen. The Pacific Western Stars of the Week, the Eastern CFL Awards. We'll preview all of those things for you, and of course, Leaf will have a highlight or two if we have time at halftime. Watts threw the ball right into Skillman's hands. Oh, what a break. Rod Skillman was standing there. J.C. Watts could have eaten the ball. Instead, he tried to get it upfield. Covington had him wrapped up, and he just drilled the ball into Skillman. This comes with 28 seconds left to play in the half. Well, it sure makes it exciting, but I know both coaches would be really upset at their quarterbacks. 
the, this is a ball you shouldn't throw. You got the lead at halftime. Just take the sack. You got the best kicker in the league with 28 seconds left. Kick it out of trouble. Boy, oh boy, JC, you don't throw those balls, but nice play by Rod Skillman. The ball is at the Toronto 31 yard line. The flag comes down as Kerrigan had his arm hit just as he was prepared to throw it. And holding will be the call against the Thai Cats. Well, what had been a very, very well played first half is deteriorating a little here. The final holding, minutes. Hamilton number 66. First down repeated. Miles Gorell is called for holding. Well, that's why they let him go in Montreal a few years ago. Joe Gallat simply said, this guy takes too many holding penalties. He kills us out there. But He told us that in an airport one day. Yeah. Remember, he said, the guy is killing us. So the ball is now back outside the 41-yard line. 23 seconds left, as you see. Clock starts on the snap of the ball. The pass is caught by Stapler. Boy, that is a real timing pattern because the moment he turned around, the ball was there. Couldn't have had better coverage by Kerry Parker, but that's a big play now. They've, they've at least got it back into field goal range for Paul Osbaldison. They're going to go to the hurry-up offense. Take a shot now at the end zone. You've got 18 seconds left. 11 seconds left, Luke. Excuse me. 18 seconds. You were right. I was looking at the score. <laughs> Rocky DiPietro down to the 15-yard line. David Marshall was there to make the stop. All right, take your time out now. I think 10 seconds left. Take the time out. They're going to do that. Now you've got one shot into the end zone from the 15-yard line. If you catch it, of course, you score. If it goes incomplete, the clock stops and you get to kick the field goal. So Kerrigan goes over to have a chat with Al Bruno. There's Tom Porras, the backup quarterback, number eight. As Toronto hangs on to a six-point lead, they obviously figured they were going to the dressing room with that lead, but it, chances are this score is going to change here in the final ten seconds. It's really been funny, I think, the play of Mike Kerrigan here in the first half. He's really been hot and cold. He's had some super drives, and then he's thrown some horrible balls that's been, that have been intercepted. He's thrown three of them. But then these last two, that pass to Stapler, the pass to DiPietro, were just super throws. Well, Tony Champion's been the big play man in most of the games against Toronto this year. Maybe he's the guy they'll go to. You don't think they'd look for Rocky, eh? Well, that's, that's a good as choice as you could make. I agree. Well, there's the old spy calling Tony Champion, and of course it did go to Champion. There was contact in the end zone. No penalty marker comes down on Daryl Wilson. And so with five seconds left, it's second down. Now, now Porras and Osbaldiston are both coming out onto the field, so we'll have the field goal attempt. Well, the Ticats did the smart thing. They, Al Bruno, you credit him with all that because he had the presence to call a timeout to get a shot in the end zone, but now at least Paul Osbaldiston will have a chance to add three. And when you're in a total point series, every point counts. Mm -hmm. This time it is good. So with two seconds left on the clock, the Toronto lead is now just three points. Toronto 17, Hamilton 14. It was 7-0 at the end of the first quarter for the Ticats. And it has been a very entertaining first half up until the final couple of minutes of it. And then they kind of got sloppy and took ridiculous penalties and threw passes that shouldn't have been thrown. Well, it still makes for excitement, though. It sure <laughs> does. Even if you're throwing those interceptions. It's funny how you approach a game like this. Two game total point. Well, you know, this is halftime of the first game, but really the whole first game is just the half. It's, it's, mentally, it's got to be kind of tough for the players at times. Argos are just going to ground the ball. JC does that. And so the Argos go to the locker room with a three-point advantage after the first half 
of this, the first game of the two-game total point series. Argos have to be very pleased with themselves. They played well on both sides of the ball, capitalized on their opportunities. The Hamilton Ticats moved the ball up and down the field, but had three big interceptions, and not a whole lot of people on their side of the ledger are going to be pleased about that. But Upcoming in our halftime show, the Pacific Western Airlines Stars of the Week, including a review of the big winners in the second half of the regular season. We'll also run down the Eastern Award winners, the Eastern Shenley nominees. This is Game 1 of the Eastern Championship on CTV.